Welcome to a very special episode of An Architecture. We had said that episode 8 would be the final episode of the Citizen of Nowhere series, which is in the works. However, we have had a bit of a detour. Uh, we had the opportunity this week to be interviewed by Tom Woods on his podcast. Now, I think a lot of our listeners at the moment have come to us as a result of some of the publicity that Tom has given us, so these listeners probably don't need much introduction. But for anyone who's not familiar with him, I want to emphasize that Tom's not just some hack doing this thing out of his living room. Like us. <laughs> like us. He's got a bachelor's in history from Harvard, PhD from Columbia. He's written 12 books, two of which are New York Times bestsellers, and those are Meltdown and The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. He does a daily podcast, which he's recorded over 800 episodes, and our episode here is 802. He's on 800. We're on 008. <laughs> Tom puts out as much in a week as we do in a year. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you'll see in the interview that he's a great communicator. He's got a good sense of humor. I've always thought of him as one of the nicest guys in the liberty movement. Now, that was until I got onto Twitter and see what he does to people on there, because <laughs> I'll sometimes get into these wars with these trolls and just take them apart. Up until I started reading his Twitter account, you know, I thought he was the nicest guy in the Liberty Movement. He's still a nice guy, but <laughs> just don't get on the wrong side of him on Twitter. <laughs> Not only is Tom possibly the nicest guy in the Liberty Movement, I also think of him as kind of the James Brown of the Liberty Movement. And I don't mean that he can dance, although I hear that there are some videos from the Contra crews floating around. <laughs> but he's got to be the hardest working man in the Liberty Movement. The amount of stuff this guy puts out on a daily basis is just incredible. That's funny. I described him to my wife as the Oprah of the libertarian movement. <laughs> he's a guy, he's got, you know, he's got a daily show. He's interviewing new people every day. He gives stuff away. He does makeovers and he has billions of dollars. <laughs> and as Joe said, when he promoted our podcast, we got the Woods bump, which is, I guess, his equivalent of the Oprah effect. So the way we got in touch with Tom was that he has a promotion where he's got an affiliate link for web hosting. And we used his link when we set up an architecture about a year ago. And he's got a promotion where if you use his link, he'll give you a shout out on his show and give you some free publicity, which is great because he's got tens of thousands of listeners. So it's a huge audience. And he did give us that shout out a couple of weeks ago. And we immediately saw our page views and episode downloads jump by an order of magnitude from a few hundred to a few thousand, which is pretty incredible. And so that's what we call the Woods Bump. So while we were in touch with him regarding that publicity, we discussed the possibility of doing an interview with us on his show. I guess one thing about having a daily podcast is you're always hungry for content. So I guess he thought that we could offer something that he hadn't previously done in his previous 800 episodes. <laughs> and I hope that we delivered on that. <laughs> the topic that we proposed to Tom was, why should libertarians care about the built environment? So the idea was that this would be kind of an introduction and overview to a lot of the ideas that we're discussing on our podcast. So it's partly a review of some of the ideas we presented in the first, mostly the first three episodes. But we also have some new content on there that we haven't really touched yet in the podcast. As we were preparing for the episode, we gave Tom a laundry list of topics that amounts to kind of our master plan for, the, for everything we would ever want to cover on the podcast. <laughs> so obviously we didn't get to all that and it wasn't our intent to get to all that. Tom went through and kind of picked and chose the questions that he wanted to ask to give his listeners a, a good kind of sampling of what we're all about. And you'll hear early in the episode, he makes a comment about some possible repeat visits. So, so hopefully the interview went well enough that he'll actually take us up on that. <laughs> Tom's audience is primarily libertarians. And not only that, but specifically the type of libertarian that we are, which you might call an, an Austro-libertarian after the Austrian School of Economics or anarcho-capitalist. We don't use that word a lot. We feel it's kind of clunky. Yeah, and you'll hear in the episode, there's one point where I think I actually trip over that word <laughs> and mispronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a mouthful. So we, we prefer to just use the term anarchism, which we think implies capitalism anyways, because the opposite of capitalism is some kind of fascism. But if we're splitting hairs, we technically fall into the, the anarcho-capitalist camp. And so we were really kind of preaching to the choir here during the episode, you'll hear us make a number of references to other thinkers and writers in the libertarian movement without a lot of explanation. And so in this, our episode, we'll take some time afterwards to flush those out a little bit and explain who we're talking about and what some of their main ideas are. Yeah, so there's a bit of inside baseball and sort of libertarian jargon that we throw around during this interview. If you stay tuned afterwards, we'll come back and do a bit of a post game. So without further ado, here's The Tom Woods Show, episode 802. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. 
Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're searching for a gift for that shaver in your life, then check out harrys.com where you can get a holiday shave set that's thoughtful and practical. Heck, I bought one for that weasel Michael Malice, but don't tell him because he hasn't gotten it yet. Take $5 off at harrys.com with coupon code WOODS. Hi everybody, Tom Woods here. Very glad to be talking today to two identical twin brothers, Tim and Joe Brochu, who happen to live on opposite ends of the earth from each other and who together do the An Architecture podcast, which you can check out at anarchitecturepodcast.com. According to their site, the An Architecture podcast explores the built environment through an anarcho-capitalist lens. Tim Brochu is a registered architect with 13 years' experience. His brother Joe is a mechanical engineer based in Adelaide, South Australia. All right, let's turn now to Tim and Joe. I'm looking at some notes and we could easily be talking for days on end, and maybe we should do that and split it up into multiple episodes. I listened to an episode of the An Architecture podcast that went into a lot of some of the basic and frankly somewhat mundane sorts of things that human beings do, like getting their garbage picked up, and you went through and tried to explain how these sorts of things could be handled in a non-state environment. Now, you guys are uh, one of you is an, an architect, and the other, uh, Joe. How would you describe your line of work? I mean, you're you're an engineer, but what kind of engineer? <laughs> uh, these days, I'd probably call myself some sort of a multidisciplinary engineer. Uh, my education was in mechanical, but these days I work a lot with uh, power stations, so I've picked up a bit of electrical along the way as well. All right. Now, in dealing with other people in your respective professions, do you find that there is an ideological slant that is common to people in your respective fields? Tim, why don't I ask you first? Yeah, I would say with architects, I actually found an article recently that where somebody had studied this and found that architects were one of the most kind of left-leaning <laughs> professions out there. Really? And and I think there are a few reasons for this. One is that just kind of demographics, for whatever reason, um, a lot of architects and architecture firms are in cities uh, where the demographics tend to lean more kind of Democrat voting. Um, but I think there's also kind of a deeper mindset that architects have where just because of what we do and the way that we look at the world, um, I think we have a natural sympathy for kind of central planning <laughs> because, you know, we look at the world and, and we want to improve it when we, we try to find ways to, to make it better. And so I think that the natural instinct for an architect is to look at a city and want to just reorganize the whole thing uh, kind of in their image. <laughs> so for one thing, I think that that does make them kind of lean more towards statist and, and possibly leftist type of solutions. But I think that also opens up the possibility for introducing more libertarian thought to them. Um, because for the same reason, they are kind of forward looking and sometimes even idealistic and utopian. There have been a lot of famous architects who have put forth utopian visions of the world. Um, and we're not necessarily trying to get to some kind of utopia with the ideas that we're promoting. Um, but I think that architects are receptive to um, kind of out-of-the-box ideas and especially ideas about um, how society can be organized and how that's reflected in the built environment. And with engineers, I think uh, they're a bit more of a mixed bag politically. Um, for one thing, uh, engineers, th their favorite thing to do is to tell you why something won't work. And I think this makes them uh, very good candidates to be libertarians. Now, engineers, of course, like solving problems using kind of complex chains of reasoning. And so I think that they'd be receptive to some of the ideas that we present, especially with Austrian economics and kind of libertarian property rights theory and all that kind of thing. You know, they like to take things apart, find out how they work and to break them down in, into kind of the root causes. All right. Now, talk about let's talk about where the two of you are. You guys do a podcast together and yet you live not exactly next door. <laughs> yeah. And so Joe and I are actually twin brothers, but we live about as far apart from each other on the world as you possibly could. I think if you put your take a globe and put your finger where I live, which is in the Boston area and where Joe lives in Adelaide, Australia, you could spin the globe on your fingers. <laughs> um, and so that creates a challenge for us making the podcast because um, there's such a big time difference between those uh, between where we live. So the way it typically works is I wake up at 
let's say six in the morning, go down into my basement. I'm bleary eyed. I'm trying to sip on a cup of coffee. My kids are stomping around upstairs and I can barely think, let alone talk. You know, and I pull up this, I pull up Skype and call Joe and here comes Joe on the video. He's well rested. The kids are in bed, you know, nice dim lights. It's 930 at night where he is. <laughs> He's got soft music playing in the background. He's got a <laughs> Heavy pour red wine in his hand and wearing my smoking jacket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's what we're working with uh, when we when we try to take on each of our podcast episodes. Well, sounds like fun. Now you you use this term the built environment, and you talk about why libertarians should be tackling some of these questions related to the built environment. Well, what does that mean? Uh, the built environment is essentially all of the physical structures and infrastructures that we people create in the world around us. Uh, to make it work the way we want it to. So at the smaller scale of kind of the individual, uh, it's our homes, it's our offices, shops and restaurants and parks, and all those kinds of spaces and, and facilities that we occupy. We can zoom out from that to the scale of the city where we start thinking about roads and transit systems, as well as utilities like electrical and wastewater systems. And then beyond that, we can zoom out a little further to uh, broader regions of area where we look at ideas like urbanization and suburbanization and trying to understand the overall forces that are driving certain types of development uh, in the land. So let's talk about some specific examples of this, because some of the specific things that you'd be talking about are considered to be puzzles for libertarians to solve because everybody is accustomed to the traditional government solution. And of course, roads is the classic example, but that's not the only one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one thing with, with the roads is, uh, you know, we, we've got the joke about, you know, who will build the roads, which to, to libertarians is just kind of a, a throwaway joke, but to everybody else, it's this baffling puzzle, you know, that they think that uh, in an anarchic society, it just wouldn't happen that everyone would have to be walking from one place to another. And of course, that's pretty ridiculous. So, and I think one way to answer that is to ask back, you know, who do you think might build the roads in such a society? I mean, one thing about that is, you know, the next time that person's sitting in traffic, instead of thinking, you know, why don't they build more pu public transport? Maybe they can start thinking about, you know, why hasn't supply met demand on this strip of expensive capital infrastructure that I can use for free? Yes. As, as soon as you start <laughs> uh, asking the question that way, you're halfway to the answer. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, that's one thing about these uh, built environment issues is that it's a there's a lot of issues that people are really familiar with. You know, obviously, we all experience the built environment every day. And so if you can kind of plant some of these seeds, you can really get people thinking, um, you know, a bit more creatively than just relying to this default of, you know, the government can provide it through taxes or something like that. Part of our goal with our podcast is to it's kind of twofold. One is to bring these ideas of libertarianism um, to people like architects who are interested in the development of the built environment. And the other is to get libertarians familiar with what the discussions are that are happening uh, within the development of the built environment. We see this as a way to, you know, a lot of libertarian ideas and theories and discussions are very abstract. We talk about legal systems and insurance companies <laughs> and all of this stuff, where when we start talking about the built environment, these are really concrete, tangible things that people can understand viscerally and, and kind of grab a hold of. And they also tend to be things that are not really politicized. Um, new developments in the built environment often happen at the local level. And, you know, if somebody wants to, it would typically be a city or, or a local government, wants to, let's say, build a new road somewhere, that's not really a politicized issue. It's not a left or right issue. It's just more of a pragmatic uh, discussion. And if libertarians can be involved in those discussions, then I think that we can, I think that's a good forum for libertarians to start to get their ideas heard and understood um, by normal people. All right. Well, 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 well hold on a minute. We, I think of ourselves as being sort of normal people, but I, I understand what you're saying. Well, speak for yourself, yeah, Tom. Yeah. All right. All right. So I listened to one of your uh, and architecture podcast episodes, as I say, wh where you were going through some of these uh, specific examples, and I really liked the way you you dealt with it. I thought, okay, this is this fills a real gap. These guys have thought through a whole lot of possibilities, everything from public parks to garbage collection, all the way down the line to some of these things that you know we all know we need, but it's not necessarily obvious how we would get them. 
So give me a few examples of these sorts of things and show me how you would use libertarian thinking to come up with a, a good libertarian solution. Well, I think uh, one example that I think uh, most people would agree is pretty essential is something like uh, sewage treatment. And of course, the way that this is done in most cities and suburban areas is, of course, you've got this centralized system where you've got pipes coming out of your house and making their way towards a common sewage treatment plant somewhere. This is, of course, a pretty good solution because it gets, obviously, the, the undesirable materials away from your house and treats it in a way that can be you know, pretty efficiently dealt with in a reasonably environmentally friendly manner. Now, of course, most people assume that this has to be done by some sort of state entity, you know, because they're the ones who can access the various easements under the roads and so forth to put to lay down all the pipes. And, you know, they've got the money to build a big sewage treatment plant. But that's not necessarily the way it has to happen. I mean, there's no reason that you couldn't have private companies offering the same services, especially if there's some sort of a new development or something like that, um, where they could come in, run their own pipes and then you know, try, simply charge people fees for using that service. And there's other ways to think about how this might affect the development of the built environment as well, because, you know, th there's other technologies for sort of achieving the same results. You know, obviously people who are in more remote areas might have just a, a septic system in their own backyard to handle the same problem. And so you could have competition, you know, more competition, I think, if you didn't have this state-owned kind of subsidized system where, you know, it might actually be more efficient for people to have more septic systems that they manage themselves than it is to run all this infrastructure down to some central facility. Or at least some kind of more decentralized uh, uh, system of, of waste management. Yeah. And so, so I think this sort of thing is how you can get people thinking, you know, into the, the sort of second order effects of some of these economic decisions and planning decisions that get made. You know, where it's not it's not always obvious that, you know, the, the centralized solution is the most efficient way to do something. Um, and I think that if you had more kind of free market solutions, then you'd see a lot more of these sort of substitute solutions being proposed. I remember one of the one of the points you, you guys made was that a lot of times today people are inclined to call the police. There's a problem with their neighbor. So they call the police. First thought. And maybe the neighbor finds out who called the police Maybe the neighbor doesn't find out, but either way, there's there's awkwardness forever as a result of that, <laughs> because now the the neighbor either thinks it was you or doesn't know who it is and therefore is suspicious of everybody in the neighborhood. And the point you made was that even though sometimes libertarian cooperative style solutions to problems aren't as quick and simple as convenient as picking up the phone and calling the police, at the same time, they seem to be better – for when you know, when it comes to creating neighborhood cohesiveness and and creating trust among neighbors as opposed to mistrust and who the heck ratted me out. Yeah, I think that that when we start to look at we talked about different scales of the built environment. When you think about the scale of let's say a neighborhood, the way that that people get along within their neighborhood, um, by and large, people aren't calling the police to resolve every issue that they have. Um, if there's a problem, they'll hopefully most people will go and talk to their neighbor um, and try to get it resolved that way. Um, the police are often viewed as, as, I guess, a last resort. And yet when we start to broaden the scale of people's thinking out to kind of state issues or, or national issues, um, everybody just assumes that the state should be the first response, that that should be the first place that they go um, to try to deal with a problem. I mean, that's kind of the I think of like the typical format of an NPR story is, you know, here's a problem. Uh, here's somebody who's affected by it. And here's what the government says they're going to do about it. And that's, I think that is the way that most people uh, think that that problem should be dealt with. Um, but when you start to break that down into the way people actually deal with uh, with their neighbors and within their local environment, um, that's not the way that people that's not people's natural instinct for how they want to interact with other people. You know, the other day I was – I came across on Facebook yet another thread with somebody who thinks that libertarians believe that you ought to try to screw everybody out of their money somehow and mm -hmm. just – and they, they believe this is what Ayn Rand wanted, was dishonest people who just look out for themselves. I'm not a huge Ayn Rand fan, but I know she didn't say that. Mm -hmm. They just – they look at the title of one of her books and they think they know her entire philosophy. And – I was reading – I guess the, the guy th was, was arguing that 
libertarians are against communities. They're against because they think libertarians just don't believe in, I guess, friendship or something. I, I don't know where this comes from. All, all we're saying is don't initiate violence. That doesn't mean you can't hang out with friends or go to church or have communities or be in groups or have a family. I mean, th- none of this has follows in any way from any of that. But I sometimes, though, even among libertarians, there are misconceptions. I gave an example the other day. There are libertarians, some of them who, who think that – Tennis is a more libertarian sport than football because tennis is just one person (laughs) unless it's doubles. It's just one person that has nothing to do with it. As long as you voluntarily join the football team, it's just as libertarian or not as any other sport. Well, likewise, the reason I raise this is that I live in a place in Florida that is planned out. The neighborhood I live in is totally planned. Somebody, a group, planned it. They said, we're going to have houses here. We're going to have lakes and boating and playgrounds and horses and a town square with a market and a doctor's office and a restaurant. We're going to have everything be walkable. We're going to have it nice and flat. We're not going to have any visible uh, telephone poles that make it look hideous. We're just going to have a nice, beautiful, picturesque place. And they planned it out. And there was no government involvement. It was people bought some private land. They planned this out. There's nothing non-libertarian about that. (laughs) I moved into this planned community, and I am no less libertarian for that. And I noticed that in your some of your notes, you also comment on this that you 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 want to tell libertarians that sometimes planning is okay, and libertarianism does not mean we're against planning. (laughs) Of course, you have to have planning. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, planning is sort of a trigger word for libertarians, I think. You know, they, um, as soon as they hear that, they think there's some sort of, uh, you know, UN Agenda 21 czar who's going to try to, you know, dictate everything they do or whatever. <laughs> um, but of course, that's ridiculous. Um, and, and in reality, you know, th- th- there are certainly cases when uh, some level of central planning can work, especially in developing, you know, the, the layout of a town or something like that. And like you said, in your development, it's it's a privately owned development, but it exists in a broader kind of anarchic free market, well, <laughs> relatively anarchic free market, where, like you said, you've got the, um, it, it's up to you whether or not you live there or not. You know, you can choose to live there if that's the sort of uh, place that you want to live and the sort of lifestyle that you want to have. Or if you want to be uh, living in a more urban area, you know, you can find plenty of places to move, uh, to move there. Um, I mean, I think it is interesting to have a look at the difference between, say, planned cities versus unplanned cities. Um, and especially if you're familiar with the work of someone like Jane Jacobs, you know, she's a, a real big proponent of sort of unplanned organic development of cities, um, especially in, in certain neighborhoods where you get this sort of mixed diversity of uses that really add a lot of character to, to a small neighborhood block or to a district of a city. All right, I want to say something about Jane Jacobs also, but first let's thank our sponsor. All right, I'm about to find out if my listeners can keep a secret. I'm going to tell you what I got that weasel Michael Malice, frequent guest here on the show, for Christmas. I got him a Harry's Shave Set. Now, there are a whole bunch of these shave sets starting at just 15 smackers. They all come with a razor handle, shaving cream, replacement blades, and a travel cover. But the one I got for Malice has all the bells and whistles you can possibly imagine. Plus, I got it engraved with his initials on the razor and the stand. It is a beauty of a gift. And, it's of course, it flatters him having the initials on there, so his ego will really go for that. But it's a beautiful and practical and personalized gift. So I'm getting it for him. And if he finds out about it, I know it's because you guys told him. But if you want to get a great gift for your dad, your brother, some man who shaves, then the Harry's gift sets are perfect for you. Check them out at harrys.com and click on gifts and you're off to the races. Ground shipping for the holidays ends December 16th. So hurry over to harrys.com and take five smackers off your purchase with coupon code WOODS. Let me jump in on on Jane Jacobs because I think the reason that she's been interesting to a lot of our folks is that she's argued that some of these urban planning types have planned cities that don't really work and that some of the reason that you get a lot of crime is that they've planned cities where there aren't there aren't enough eyes on the street. It's not it's not a natural naturally occurring organic thing. It's a planned thing that seems like it would work to an intellectual but doesn't actually work for real people. I mean, I think one way to look at that is if you, you know, you take this planned city, if you look at it on a map or on, on a plan, it makes a lot of sense. You know, you, you can kind of see how everything's laid out. Um, it looks like it's really efficient to get from one place to the next. 
Um, but what it lacks is the detail that actually occurs at human scale once that's developed. And, and again, that's something that um, you know, Jane Jacobs is really big on, is, is really emphasizing that human scale and, and looking at how do people actually use those spaces um, and w- what are some of the different uses that they, can, that they come up with. Um, and again, drawing from these uses, you know, what effect does that have on how the, how the city develops and um, the, the sort of, um, I guess you'd call them um, positive externalities that develop uh, like you said, eyes on the street, you know, and, and you do have this community developing as well. And, and I think, uh, you know, Jane Jacobs, the way she approaches this stuff is very Hayekian. I mean, I'm not, I don't really know if she was reading Hayek at the time she was writing this, but um, I think it's actually a way that you can use, um, you can use kind of the, the ideas of Jane Jacobs to introduce the idea of kind of Hayekian self-organization, um, e- even to people like, you know, who would be more left-leaning. Uh, I think there's a bit of common ground there between people on the left who like to live in cities, um, you know, who benefit from these sort of, you know, Greenwich Village style neighborhoods, um, as well as people on, who are libertarians who kind of instinctively can appreciate this sort of organic, unplanned development. One thing that's important to think about there when you talk about planning and the, the, the type of community you just described, Tom, Um, there's a difference between planning, uh, kind of setting the guidelines for an area and actually mapping out and drawing the whole thing. So some of those utopian kind of plans, uh, I guess you'd call the modernist plans, um, from the mid century that Jane Jacobs was reacting to, uh, some of them were very, uh, they, they took, let's say they took zoning to an extreme. So they would have everybody parceled out into different areas according to what they were doing, whether it was a residential area, um, a commercial area, even a separate entertainment area, a separate government area. And the idea was that there was this rational um, organization of society. But as Joe said, that's not, that's just not the way that people actually interact. Um, And what really makes, uh, what really makes cities and streets successful is not necessarily the overall plan, but the individual businesses that pop up within that plan. Um, That's what keeps people coming back. Um, It's not that they want to go and see this grand public space one more time. It's that they want to go and go to that little coffee shop or that food truck um, that they know they can find there. So again, that gets back to Jane Jacobs' points about, um, about focusing on the individual and the human scale. So planning per se is not a problem. You can have entrepreneurial planning. But I notice here in some of what you've written when you're looking over examples of a bunch of planning failures, you've got um, a number of cases that are related to Boston, which is not surprising given that uh, one of you is from Boston and and I actually grew up in that area. Can you flesh out some examples of failed planning and what the root of the failure was? Yeah, I mean, when I'm talking about Boston um – I think probably most people, especially Bostonians, would agree that one of the biggest kind of urban planning failures in the city is Boston City Hall Plaza. This was an area where they, in the 1960s, it was one of these more organic type of neighborhoods that Jane Jacobs might promote, um, although it had fallen into, I guess you'd call it some blight and disrepair. Um, But the whole neighborhood was raised and taken down to build what is now just a sea of brick, this huge open plaza. And in the middle of it stands this oppressive, brutalist concrete building, which is Boston City Hall. And when you walk in there, it just feels oppressive as you're walking through it. You just imagine all these little bureaucrats kind of peering down at you from six stories above from these little windows. And I think the idea there was that if you built this grand civic space, that, you know, if you built it, that people would come and just want to mill about the halls of government, you know, and, and be engaging in civic discussions, maybe like the Roman Forum or something. Uh, but of course, the reality is that you go there and it's just a wasteland. There's nobody there. The only people you see are the people getting off of the tea stop, walking down the steps down to Quincy Market, which actually is an active used, uh, space that people use. In fact, the only time I've actually seen City Hall Plaza truly being used was in 2002 when the Patriots had won their first Super Bowl and they had a duck boat parade (laughs) that ended there and they had a big rally. So apparently that's what it takes to get people to activate the City Hall Plaza for one of Boston sports teams to win a championship. (laughs) 
Yeah, that's funny. And now that I think about it, of all the time I've spent in Boston, I don't think I've ever been in City Hall Plaza. <laughs> well, you're not missing much. <laughs> yeah, apparently not. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't feel so bad. Um, all right, I, I don't. Oh, you know what? You know what? I feel like as long as I have you guys on here, give me an effort to try to help us understand the road question. I mean, I've I've had people <laughs> talk about it before, and yet I still, even I, only feel like eighty percent satisfied. So. <laughs> What do you say about the roads? Who wants to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that, Tom. This is Joe. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, Walter Block's written the book, uh, The Case for Road Privatization, which is probably uh, the Bible on this topic. And <laughs> actually, I'll admit that I haven't myself read that whole book, but I've, I'm familiar with you know, quite a few of his arguments. Um, but essentially, it's, you know, it's, there's a very similar pattern here to any of these other issues that we discuss, where once you start asking the question of, you know, who should own these roads? You know, who, who actually is qualified and experienced enough to build them? And, uh, and how do you make that work? I mean, I, I think I've heard you say before on your, on your show, it's basically, you know, it's not like you're going to, someone's going to build a store somewhere and there's going to be all these people living in a house somewhere else. And they're just going to be thwarted from working to, from finding each other because there's no roads between them. I mean, obviously they're going to find some way to make that happen. And of course, there's a number of different ways in which this could happen. Um, you know, obviously the, the store themselves might be interested in building a road out to where, you know, where their customers are and they might even fund that themselves, you know, and this is a, a similar concept to something like parking validation, except it's maybe extended out to road validation. Um, and of course, another much kind of simpler and, and more obvious way is just to have toll roads where people can drive around and maybe you've got a little easy pass sort of thing on your car and, uh, wherever you go, you know, you get pinged on your credit card for, um, for the amount of roads that you've used. And there's of course, different commercial models that you can use to price this sort of thing. So you could have some sort of a, you know, an unlimited subscription service where you could, you've got access to all the roads in a town. Um, maybe you've got some sort of, you know, you've got, you can drive 500 kilometers in a month or something like that. And then if you need more, you can top it up, you know, just like a mobile phone plan. Um, I think one interesting way to approach all this stuff is to think not so much about the technical solutions, but more about the commercial solutions. So really, you're not necessarily thinking, OK, well, well how are they going to build a road? I mean, everyone kind of knows how a road is built. Uh, what's much more interesting is how are they going to fund that road and keep it viable uh, so that the people who want to use it can can keep it running? Yeah. And beyond the economic um, case for pri privatizing roads. One thing that we're actually exploring in the current episode that we're working on is the question of rights to the road. So even if you have a private road, how do we know that they're going to open up that road to everybody who might want to use it? How do you prevent that road owner from kind of clamping down and just restricting people or charging an exorbitant price uh, for people to use the road? And one thing we're exploring is, is challenging the kind of orthodox uh, anarcho-capitalist idea of property rights. Um, not that we want to give up property rights by any means, but we're looking at the idea of different uses of land. And in other words, that rather than homesteading a piece of property and that's yours and you have all the rights to that property, that it may make more sense to allow for a legal system that allows for homesteading of uses of the land. So for example, it might be possible for somebody to, to homestead a piece of land that they're going to turn into a road, um, or at least they're going to claim ownership of that land. But if it's a, a piece of land that other people have been traveling over for years and years, I think there could be an argument there that the public use of that land has been homesteaded, even while it's owned by uh, a private owner. So it essentially becomes an easement for people to use that land uh, for public use. So this is something that's that's a bit of a challenge to the um, I guess what would be Rothbardian, you know, anarcho-capitalism uh, property rights. Um, but I think that if we're going to uh, communicate with people about how this can work, I think we have to start thinking about um, different ways in which we allocate property rights that allow for these kind of easements um, to truly define not just roads or right of ways, but even thinking about public space. Um, public space is a necessary function in any society. And as, as anarcho-capitalists, I think we want to try to define a way that public space can, um, can emerge within an anarchic society. Look, let me raise a devil's advocate sort of objection. Could we – would you consider it legitimate, even partly, for somebody to say 
that you libertarians have a pre-existing ideological desire for – Yeah, and we're not saying it's bad, but you have this desire to have – peaceful interaction, no coercion, and the result of that means that in some of the cases like you're describing, you have to go a very clunky route to get things done, whereas the government could go a much more quick, efficient, crack some skulls, get it done sort of route. Uh, is the re- is, now, I guess my, my question is, can you make both a natural rights and a utilitarian argument for the libertarian approach, or does it basically boil down to, yeah, it would be probably a lot better to just do the roads by eminent domain and cracking skulls and raising taxes, but our way at least doesn't involve any of that? Or would you say that actually our – not only that, but our roads would be better or our garbage collection would be better. All these other things would be better. See what I mean? Yeah, so Tom, it's interesting. There is actually one country in the world where two-thirds of their roads – are managed by what they call private road associations. And, and as you're driving around that country, you'll see all these signs that say private road. Now, it doesn't mean that it's a private road in the sense that the public can't drive on it. What it means is that it's managed by these private road associations. And so uh, I'll give you three guesses as, as to which anarcho-capitalist utopia this country might be. <laughs> I actually don't know. <laughs> well, I think uh, I think most Bernie Sanders supporters would be shocked to learn that this is Sweden. Wow! And so, uh, <laughs> so now I think we've discovered the real reason why Sweden's so great. You know, it's not because they've got socialism; it's because they've got private roads. Very interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Tom, to to give a broader answer to your question, uh, one problem that we face as people who are promoting a, a more kind of libertarian society. For one thing, we have to define what that society would look like in the end game. But the bigger problem is describing how do we get from here to there. Um, and so that gets you into a, a process of privatization or divestiture of government assets where you know, we already have this, this framework of land ownership and of uh, management of, of services within the built environment that's really hard to break down. Um, so I think one of the challenges for us is to define how a kind of divestiture process might happen that would allow those things to come into private hands. And again, when we say private hands, um, that might mean that every taxpayer or every citizen gets some share of ownership of a particular road or a highway or a park. And so I think there's a lot of interesting discussion that can happen there about not just defining uh, what the big picture is for an anarchic society, but also how do you get from here to there? And that presumably is a good chunk of what you guys are talking about. Uh, tell, tell me about – you've got the podcast, but tell me about how people can actually – other than finding an architecture on, the, uh, on a podcatcher, how can they follow what you're doing online? You have a website you can tell us about? Yeah, so our website is anarchitecturepodcast.com. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a, a mouthful, especially uh, when we're trying to post stuff on Twitter. We've, we've realized that uh, having a long name like that is uh, a bit of a liability. Um, but uh, an easy way to remember it is unarchitecturepodcast.com. Um, so on that website, we've got, of course, the podcast, but we also do some blog posts. Uh, we do the occasional silly meme um, and then we're also reasonably active on Twitter. You know, we might share some articles on there um, and, and do a bit of commentary. Um, so our, our Twitter handle is uh, anarchitecturep. Um, and of course, you can find that on our webpage as well. One thing we try to put up on Twitter is finding kind of real world success stories of people who are doing or coming up with the kind of solutions that we're trying to promote on our podcast. So we'll try to find examples of people uh, who are finding ways to develop the built environment where they're not relying on or possibly outright rejecting the typical government approaches. Um, and in fact, one of these I think that we tweeted, Tom, was your donor sea house that uh, your listeners contributed to to build. So we thought that was a great example of um, individuals taking initiative to, um, to make a change that they want to see without relying on government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That really, that episode of my show uh, with uh, Gret Glyer, that was one of my favorites because there's a guy who wanted to make a change, and he went out and did it. And then on Twitter, he said, hey, Tom Woodshow listeners, we're going to try and build this widow a house. And within a couple of days, they had raised the money to build a house. Now they've already made a video of people uh, showing us the house and the family walking <laughs> through and, and look, showing us the inside of the house. It's, it's unbelievable. 
what, what's what's going on. And and the, the idea that we could do that, we could coordinate halfway across the world. We could coordinate the building of a house, donate the resources for that, but we couldn't lay down some tar <laughs> from your house to a store. Really, you have that little confidence in mankind? <laughs> anyway, all right. So anarchitecturepodcast.com is where people should go. I'll have that and your Twitter up at tomwoods.com slash 802. Thanks, guys. I appreciate what you're doing. Great. Thanks a lot, Tom. Thanks a lot, Tom. All right. Let's talk about what's coming up tomorrow for episode 803. It's Peter Schiff returning to the show. And I solicited questions from the supporting listeners in my private Facebook group. If you have not yet joined that elite group of wonderful individuals, then become a supporting listener of the show over at supportinglisteners.com. You'll be amazed at all the goodies I give you. It's unbelievable the stuff I give away if you help me out. So supportinglisteners.com, and you, you'll you be part of the cream of the crop of the human race. What can I tell you? Anyway, that's where I went to try to get some good questions for Peter. So we're going to ask him some questions. So that'll be a lot of fun. I, got some, I, I have some other guests lined up that I was inspired to invite thanks to the supporting listeners coming up with, you know, frankly, ideas I wouldn't have thought of. So we got some got some juicy ones coming up. I'm going to bring Lou Rockwell back again next week by popular demand. So a lot of great stuff coming up. Check out supportinglisteners.com and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. So that was it. That was our interview with Tom. So Joe, how do you think it went? Yeah, I was pretty happy with it. I mean, I think we got across a lot of our key points. Yeah, I agree. And we managed to crack a few jokes, <laughs> which is the most important part. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was definitely an interesting experience for us because we haven't really done that sort of almost a live radio, live interview sort of presentation before. <laughs> right. People probably don't realize ex- just how much editing goes into our shows <laughs> to take out all the ums and ahs and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The way that we normally put a, uh, a sentence together <laughs> is kind of like... Uh, <laughs> you know, like, uh, this. This is why it takes us two months to release one episode. <laughs> I've got to listen to that kind of crap for, for three hours for every hour that we record. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this was a, this was a very different experience and kind of a challenge for us to think on our feet and keep the conversation moving. You know, there were a couple spots where I felt like I was kind of talking myself into a corner or like I'd start a thought and then not know how to finish it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this episode for me was a bit of a reversal because normally Tim's one that has to get up at 6 a.m. But for me, we recorded the episode at something like 3 p.m. East Coast time in the U.S. And for me, that was 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. or something like that. So, So I actually was the one I had to get up early this time around. And I just I slept like crap the night before. It was one of those nights where... As soon as I doze off, one of the kids wakes up and starts screaming and I've got to go take care of them or something like that. And then at some point in the middle of the night, one of them ended up in our bed and was kicking me in the back all night, that sort of thing. So so I I got out of bed about 5 a.m., hopped in the shower and then made myself a nice strong cup of coffee. (laughs) And I think that managed to get me through it. The format was a bit of a challenge, too, as, as anybody who's ever been on a conference call knows. It's just not a natural way to communicate with people. Uh, we were on a Skype, I guess a group Skype call. And it's the kind of thing where you finish talking and you don't know who's going to start talking next or or you don't know if somebody else has finished talking and you're supposed to start talking. <laughs> and so there are a few points where, you know, we try to j- drop a couple of jokes and you wait for a response and then nobody says anything on the other end. <laughs> you just get crickets. <laughs> and I think Tom probably mutes his microphone after he asks a question. So there's always a little bit of a delay there rather than a more kind of conversational back and forth. But we know that he's laughing with that mic muted. <laughs> yeah, we had some technical challenges too where when we first tried to do the call, Tim's got this Mac laptop which is from like 1984 or something like that. Yeah, it's the one in the ad when the Olympic runner throws a hammer through the movie screen. That's the sort of technical setup that we're working with here on the An Architecture podcast. <laughs> right. Of course, I shouldn't talk because this is coming from a guy who uses an old pair of boxer shorts as a pop filter on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think we've got to get that donation page set up so we can uh, up our game here. I just want all the listeners who have spent hours 
ingesting this podcast to understand that every word I say has been filtered through a, a pair of boxer shorts that I've been wearing for like 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> literally talking out of my ass. You're literally talking shit. So, of course, we didn't find out until Tom was calling us that I had this technical issue because and the reason is that I couldn't upgrade Skype on my old computer. So I had to run up. I had another computer up and running with my show notes on it. So I just ran and grabbed a pair of, you know, iPhone headphones and put those on plugged into the other computer. So my entire recording rig was essentially useless. <laughs> <laughs> I might as well just have been talking on my phone. But yeah, and as a result, Tim's mic was a little hot because we didn't really have time to kind of fine tune the levels and everything before we started rolling. But I think it ended up sounding OK anyways. Yeah, we made it work. It was interesting for us seeing kind of how the sausages get made on the Tom Woods show. Um, I mean, I've been listening to Tom since literally episode one of that podcast. Hmm. He used to be one of my favorite lecturers. He's got a lot of lectures available on YouTube and Mises.org and a few other places like that. And and so when he released his podcast, I got right on board and started listening to it. And I've probably listened to 95% of his episodes at least. Really? Oh, yeah. Because they're relatively short episodes. You know, they may be 30, 40 minutes long for the most part. I'll usually queue up kind of the week's worth on a Saturday morning when I'm frying up my bacon or something like that and and listen to it all at 1.8 speed. Yeah. And I do listen to Tom's podcasts. I don't listen to a lot of podcasts in general, but when I do listen, I listen to the Tom Woods show. So like any sort of live event, there's always going to be some hiccups that arise during the recording. Now, before we got online with Tom, Tim and I were talking to each other and just going through our outline And uh, somehow I I spilled a glass of water on my desk and I I sort of quickly cleaned it up. Luckily, I had another pair of boxer shorts lying around, (laughs) so so I was able to to mop that up, (laughs) most of it. But then uh, about halfway through the recording with Tom, I was in the middle of saying something and all of a sudden I started smelling smoke and it it smelled a bit like like an electrical fire or something like that. I'm thinking, oh man, I hope I didn't like, because I've got the power strip under my desk, you know, where everything's plugged into and I was thinking like, oh my God, I bet some of that water got into that power strip. <laughs> I've just started an electrical <laughs> fire while I'm on the line with Tom Woods. <laughs> but as it turned out, I looked under the desk, couldn't find anything. I, I don't know what the smell actually was, and, and it did eventually go away. There was another part of the podcast where we were going back and forth a bit, and Joe kind of posed a question to Tom. And it was one of these awkward moments where, you know, you ask a question and you don't get a response. And Tom comes back on after a second or two and says, oh, hold on, hold on. I got to move my cat. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently his cat has gotten in there and jumped up on the computer or something. So, so it's good to know that, uh, that even the pros have their little glitches from time to time. So, Joe, what did you think some of the highlights were from the episode? I think the moment I'm most proud of was using the term undesirable material as a euphemism for what travels through a sewage pipe. (laughs) (laughs) I came up with that one on the spot and I was pretty happy with myself. I sometimes think our podcast has a lot of undesirable material. (laughs) Yeah, I think the best moments are the ones like that that are unscripted, but they're still a bit of a flash of inspiration on the spot. You came up with this thing about an NPR story. Sometimes I forget you've got your own side script that you've worked on that you haven't shown me. (laughs) Because you come up with some of these things that just sound fully formulated. (laughs) And they're just on the spot. Whereas I need to have everything scripted out before I can say it. Yeah, no, that NPR. And it's funny. It's the same kind of thing where that NPR bit, it's something I had thought about years ago while I was actually commuting to work and listening to NPR. (laughs) Um, But I haven't thought about it in a while. And it's funny when you're in this format where you're just kind of rattling things off, what pops into your head and and what you reach for kind of spontaneously. So yeah, I was glad I brought that bit in there. I've always liked that kind of analogy. Yeah. I thought it was interesting to see where Tom had picked up on some of the points that we made in our earlier episode that he had listened to, which I think from what he said, it sounded like it was episode three. And the one point he mentioned was where we talked about how anarchic solutions tend to contribute to a sense of community more so than do state-sponsored solutions. I think the discussions about urban planning, uh, where we got into Jane Jacobs a bit, I thought those were pretty good. That's really a a big focus, I think, or something we want to make a big focus of our podcast. And we haven't really gotten into it yet. So I'm glad we brought some of that out on on this interview. Yeah, I've actually just been listening to the audiobook of of Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Cities, which is really a fantastic book. I mean, I I would recommend it to anyone. Yeah, why don't we take a moment and kind of back up and this is one of the names that we dropped in the episode. Why don't we explain a little bit who Jane Jacobs is and what some of her ideas were? You also mentioned Hayek in relation to her. So why don't you 
Why don't you start with Hayek and then talk about how Jane Jacobs relates to his ideas? Yeah, so Frederick Hayek was an economist from the Austrian school, and he was a student of Ludwig von Mises, who we've mentioned briefly before on the podcast. So Hayek and Mises together developed what's called Austrian business cycle theory, where they developed this explanation of what causes business cycles based on both monetary and real-world factors, with the key driver being disruptions in the system of prices, and in particular, the rate of interest. And Hayek actually won the Nobel Prize in economics in, I think, 1974. Which, by the way, isn't actually a Nobel Prize. (laughs) It's completely separate from the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel Prize for Science or whatever they are. It's actually given out by the Swedish Central Bank. And it's not actually called the Nobel Prize in economics. It's called something like the, the Economics Prize in honor of Alfred Nobel or something like that. So you can imagine that a Nobel Prize being given out by a central bank is probably not going to be the most unbiased type of prize, especially for people like Mises and Hayek, whose main contributions were criticizing central bank activity. And really pointing them out as one of the key causes of business cycles. Right. But Hayek's individual contributions are more focused on the role of information in the economy, in particular, the way that information is conveyed through market prices and what he calls the fatal conceit that central planners can actually have enough information to make decisions for a large group of people. So Hayek really emphasized the importance of all the information that's distributed amongst each individual person in a society and how markets are really the best way to communicate the information about each of those person's needs. And with this focus in mind, he developed some theories of self-organizing systems and was reasonably inspirational for the science that these days is called complexity theory or or the study of complex systems theory. So Hayek will usually get a mention in any complexity theory textbook. So the kind of individualized diffusion and dispersion of information within the economy has a corollary within the built environment. Yeah, when I started listening to that Jane Jacobs audiobook, the stuff she was saying just clicked with me right away because I was already familiar with Hayek's theories. And, And the impression I got was that she was sort of discovering the same thing on her own just by observing people in the city around her. And like I said in the interview with Tom, I'm not really sure if Jacobs had actually studied any Hayek. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if she was at least familiar with it. So just for people who aren't familiar with her work, why don't you talk a little bit about who Jane Jacobs was and and what she wrote about? What she's most famous for is this sort of ongoing feud she had with a guy named Robert Moses, who was the quintessential top-down central planner, kind of city planner, in New York City in the 1960s. And we've talked about how people on the left have some admiration for Jane Jacobs. Part of the reason for that is that she led a lot of grassroots campaigns in opposition to some of these big projects that Moses was trying to put forward. And the project she was most notably opposed to was was called the Lower Manhattan Expressway, where they were going to bulldoze a bunch of neighborhoods in Lower Manhattan, including Soho, Little Italy, Greenwich Village, in order to put an expressway through out to Brooklyn. Jane Jacobs actually wasn't formally educated, but she was an autodidact, you know, the kind of person today who would just get on Wikipedia and teach himself all kinds of stuff. And when you read her book, you can see that she's very well read and is up to speed on, on all of the various controversies regarding city planning. Yeah, she came into the world of city planning as a journalist. Her husband was an architect and she actually worked for, I think it was Architectural Record Magazine, which is still around now. And after covering a few of the typical 1960s urban renewal projects that were going on around the country, she started feeling like there was something really wrong. I think that the classic line is that some mayor or somebody was showing her this newly developed area. And she looked around and asked the question, well, where are all the people? (laughs) Which is exactly the kind of thing that we've seen at City Hall Plaza in Boston, which you mentioned on the episode. A lot of these top-down urban renewal projects that just obliterated the fabric of the city that was there beforehand and created much less human spaces, and particularly spaces and infrastructure that were much more focused on the automobile. One phrase that Tom mentioned in the episode was, eyes on the street. And what this means is simply that in an urban neighborhood, you've got all kinds of people milling about on the street. You've got shopkeepers and and residents with their windows open. And when there's all these people around like this, it actually creates a bit of a security blanket where anyone who's thinking about committing a crime on that street knows that there's probably 10 pairs of eyes watching them at any given time. And in addition, the people living in these neighborhoods tend to develop a bit of a rapport with each other, you know, where they'll just yell out the window of some kids running out in the street or something like that, (laughs) you know, where essentially everyone in the neighborhood really takes ownership of that neighborhood 
and as well as everybody in it, and they all look after each other, even if they don't actually know each other that well. What Jane Jacobs' comment there was in reaction to was the kind of, especially public housing buildings that were being put up in the 60s, where rather than building a neighborhood of streets and homes, planners started building these big high-rise buildings surrounded by parking lots and, and then green space. And this whole concept of kind of the a vertical city in the middle of a park was put forth by Le Corbusier, who was a, a very famous modern architect in the early and mid-20th century. So he was one of these utopian type of architects that we've mentioned. He actually at one point put forth a plan for Paris where he wanted to take out a huge swath of the historical Paris city center and just create a park of about 20 of these high-rise buildings with grass in between them. And at first blush, this doesn't seem like a terrible idea. I mean, it's kind of nice to free up all this dense, congested city space and to provide a lot of green space for people around where they live. And I've actually been to the first project that he built where he utilized this concept. This is called the Unité de Habitation or something like that. (laughs) Pardon my French. (laughs) in Marseille, France, and we were in Marseille over the past year during our travels, which we talked about in episode six. And I actually didn't realize the building was there until about three days before we were going to leave. We were there for two weeks. <laughs> and I started looking online if there were any, you know, while we were there, if there were any buildings I should see. And lo and behold, here's Le Corbusier's famous Unité de Habitation, <laughs> about a mile away from where we were staying. So I popped the kids on a bus and we, and we rode down there. And you could actually go through a lot of the building. I mean, for one thing, it is kind of a, a landmark now, so they let people through. So we walked through the whole building, and it's really an interesting concept, some of the things that he did in this building. The idea was that you would have elements of an entire city that were contained in one building. So it's maybe like a 12-story building. It's mostly residential, but one of the floors became a Main Street kind of area that had restaurants and shops and office space within the building. And they even had a rooftop that was accessible and had a big plaza with a, I guess what was a a concrete movie screen, you know, projection screen. And they even had a swimming pool on top of the roof that was for use of all the residents of the building. No planetarium? (laughs) Not yet, no. no. (laughs) I guess you could sit on the roof and look at the stars. As a one-off building, this was actually, I think, fairly successful. And to some extent, I think the devil is in the details here. He had a very unique layout for the apartments where each apartment spans the entire width of the building and is two stories. So you have, if you imagine it cutting off the end of the building and looking at it in section, the apartment is kind of an L shape. It stretches across the width of one floor, and then on one side it drops down, and there's a hallway in the center of that, and then the other apartment down below it is kind of in a yin-yang configuration with that. So Mm. you have three floors of apartment space, but there's only one corridor running through those. So even though it's a 12-story building, there are only like four or five levels that you get off on the elevator. So it actually creates a very livable unit with daylights and balconies at both ends of the apartment, as well as this two-story space that's fairly spacious. But as time went on and other people tried to implement some of the ideas that he had developed, of course, some of those original concepts got kind of dumbed down, and you ended up with these very banal kind of concrete buildings that didn't have all of the amenities that he had in that building, and that had units that were probably a lot less livable. And a lot of these type of developments were put forth as public housing, where you had a lot of lower income people moving into them. And after a while, many of these places were seen to be developing criminality and, and a lack of security and safety for the residents. So Jane Jacobs recognized the reason for this as being what Joe just talked about, that there weren't enough eyes on the street, that nobody felt ownership of the space around the building or even the interior spaces within the building. Everybody was kind of secluded in their little apartment and felt like everything outside their apartment was beyond their control. The most spectacular failure of one of these type of buildings was, I think it was in St. Louis, called the pruitt Igo Projects. And these were buildings that, I think it was something like 13 years after they were built, this big complex of these concrete apartment towers were torn down by the city who had built them because they realized that they were just festering criminality. And one thing that really struck me about the eyes on the street idea is that what it effectively provides is the equivalent of like a panopticon surveillance state. <laughs> except that it's a completely decentralized one. So when people think that we could be more secure by having security cameras on every corner and some central facility monitoring all of these cameras, that sort of thing sounds like something out of George Orwell's 1984. Just like my computer. (laughs) No, because I don't think your computer has a camera on it. (laughs) (laughs) So this is a good example of this sort of top-down surveillance system 
that's just creepy and it just smacks of, of this kind of total police state where everyone has something to fear all the time that they might be on the wrong side of the law. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of those apartment towers probably had security cameras of some sort or another. But unless somebody's sitting there and reacting to what's happening, they're almost completely ineffective. Yeah, and that's the other thing that the eyes on the street concept provides is that not only do you have this ubiquitous decentralized surveillance system of actual eyeballs, but each of those eyeballs has behind it a person who is able to instantly act in response to any sort of crime or other disturbance that might happen. And in addition, each of those people is capable of making their own judgments. One thing that Jacobs talks about in a book is how if something is going on, let's say there's some sort of street fight or something like that, it's not like there's one shopkeeper that's going to come out and try to break it up. There's probably 10 or 20 guys that'll come out (laughs) and break the thing up and probably take the rowdy kids home to their mothers to explain what they've done. And without even relying on these kind of reactions to negative events, I think that for somebody who's up to no good in in a particular neighborhood, just having the sense that there are other people around and other people watching and, you know, to some extent judging you, I guess, probably creates a deterrent where it's not necessarily that everybody's afraid that they're going to get caught for doing something illegal. But I think a lot of people just don't want to be embarrassed by doing something stupid. Well, apparently you haven't been keeping up with my Facebook page. (laughs) Yeah, well, I don't think there are that many eyes on your particular form of antisocial behavior. So you can see that these Hayekian ideas of distributed knowledge, it's not just about some overall quantity of knowledge that exists, but it's also about distributed judgment and distributed action. And what Hayek, and I think Jacobs also uses the term spontaneous order, that forms when people are just going about their daily lives. Were there any parts that you felt like you were putting your foot in your mouth? (laughs) There's nothing that really stood out as as something that I wish I hadn't said. Um, I feel like there were a couple of spots where I kind of got away from myself and probably didn't answer the question that that Tom was asking. (laughs) Yeah, I think I did the same. (laughs) But even when we did that, I I feel like I was still making a good point. So whatever. When I made the point about libertarians being terrified of Agenda 21 central planners (laughs) controlling their lives, I think that was a little bit more uh, harsh than what I really meant. (laughs) I think it just came off as kind of a snarky straw man kind of thing. Um, It's not really what I was trying to convey there, (laughs) Uh, but it's just just what popped into my head in the heat of the moment. You're not the first person who's guilty of calling libertarians paranoid. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, of course, there's nothing that libertarians do better than criticize other libertarians, right? Right. (laughs) I think the point I really wanted to make there was more of a, um, that was when we were talking about the potential virtues of of central planning within a certain context. And I really wanted to get more into how central planning happens in any business where you've got a boss calling the shots. And there's work that some guys in the Austrian school have done that take in some of these Hayekian insights about the value of decentralized information and the dangers of central planning. And they're able to show where some of the limitations lie for certain situations. Murray Rothbard, who I think we've mentioned on the show before, had a theory of monopoly where he showed that socialism is actually just an extreme case of monopoly and that other monopolies will actually have the same sorts of problems that socialism have. And these problems stem from Hayek's arguments that they simply don't have the information they need in order to control the whole economy because that information can only be conveyed through a market price system. And more recently, a guy named Peter Klein has written a book called The Capitalist and the Entrepreneur, where he combines these insights further and develops a theory of the firm describing how the way that this sort of information is used within certain businesses can determine which sort of corporate structures are more efficient. I think there's some insights that can be gained from applying these ideas of Rothbard and Peter Klein to the built environment in the context of city planning. Or rather than looking at what's an efficient way to run a company, you can apply the same analysis to determine what an efficient way is to plan a city. So obviously that's a bit of a mouthful, and it was a lot easier just to throw out a little snark about Agenda 21. (laughs) (laughs) Although I wish I had done it in like an Alex Jones voice. (laughs) (laughs) You want Agenda 21? (laughs) They're going to come eat your children! Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, we want to thank Tom a lot for inviting us on the show and for everything he's done to help promote our podcast and, and get us up off the ground here. And to any listeners who have come to us from the Tom Woods Show, we want to welcome you and hope that you'll go back and listen to some of our earlier episodes. 
and we are still working on the finale to the Citizen of Nowhere series. We're probably two-thirds of the way through recording it. We've got quite a bit of editing to do. With the amount of work that we still got to do on it, as well as some other personal commitments that we have, I'll actually be moving to a new house in a few weeks. <laughs> and of course, we've got the holidays as well. We'll aim to have that episode out in late January or early February. As we mentioned on the show with Tom, we have been a bit more active on Twitter and also on our blog. I recently wrote an article about a guy named Patrick Schumacher, who is the director of Zaha Hadid Architects. So anybody in the architecture world should know who I'm talking about. Zaha Hadid is a groundbreaking architect who unfortunately passed away in March of 2016. And Patrick has worked alongside her for 30 years and has now taken over leadership of that firm. What's interesting about him to us is that he recently came out and gave a presentation about the housing crisis in London. And it turns out that he's something of a hardcore anarcho-capitalist, promoting some of the same kind of ideas that we're promoting on this podcast. So, of course, he's taken a lot of heat and a lot of criticism for his statements. And to be fair, they were pretty provocative, and they were intended to be provocative. But he really hasn't gotten a fair shake from his critics. So I wrote what amounts to a defense of his presentation, specifically trying to explain how his ideas fit in the context of a theory of anarcho-capitalism. So you can find that blog post on our website. And we'll link to it in the show notes here as well at anarchitecturepodcast.com slash ANA008. Thanks everyone for listening. And we look forward to possibly doing some more episodes on the Tom Woods show. Yeah, maybe we should just have Tom do all of our episodes for us. <laughs> I think we'd be I think we'd be getting them out a lot more quickly if we did that. Yeah, he's got his own audio guy. <laughs>